Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at changinghighered.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. Our guest today is Dr. Nathan Long, president of Saybrook University. Saybrook is an online private nonprofit graduate university and premier institution for humanistic scholarship and practice. What really caught my eye about Saybrook, it's a mission-driven institution, and Dr. Long has been its driving force in its quest for increasing enrollment. He's gotten laser-focused on Saybrook's mission and did the market research to understand how and where it can grow. Have they been successful? Yes, absolutely. Over the last eight years, they've doubled their enrollment, and it's all about using sound business principles in higher education. Nathan, welcome to the program. Great to be here, Drum. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I think it's going to be a great one. You are doing some fabulous things at Saybrook, but before we get into those, I'd really like to to know a little bit more about you and how you got to here. Appreciate the question. It's um, for the sake of your audience and for you, I won't go on too long about that. I'll, I'll give you kind of the one to two minute overview of how I got to Saybrook University. So yeah, I really began my career as a music performance major. I was a, a undergrad music musician and then a professional really? musician. Yeah, yeah. Wow, cool. And during my master's work, I had a graduate TA ship in housing and really started working with uh, young men to try and keep them in school. Part of my job in the housing area was to do that. And I fell in love with student affairs. So my first taste of higher education was in the student affairs realm. And I wanted more. I I knew I wanted more. So I went into a master's program in in ed studies, got a doctorate in that, and really fell in love with the research piece, with the uh, multidisciplinary approach to education and to systems. And so from there, really, Drum, what I decided to do was pursue a faculty career and then also work in student affairs. So I tried to do both along the way. And interestingly, I was able to figure out a path at Arizona State. Wow. Yeah, I got called back to uh, Cincinnati, which was my own stomping grounds. Helped a woman at the time who was my first college president I worked for was starting up a college in nursing and health sciences there. It's a nonprofit uh, private institution. And she said, build your own liberal arts and sciences area. I'll give you whatever you need to do. I mean, like how many people... Get that. That's that's wonderful. I mean, you don't hear about that very often. No, they're trying to figure out how to cut it, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> usually, <laughs> yeah, usually. Uh, so we were we were really excited. We built that up over the years. Uh, she and I built a lot of confidence in the work uh, both I was doing and we were doing as a college. Moved up in the uh, realm of you know into a full deanship of liberal arts and sciences, and then chief academic officer. She ended up retiring, and I filled the role as an interim president, became enamored with the role. And I I thought the last thing I ever wanted to do was be an administrator for life. <laughs> and an old mentor of mine who's since passed on, he was a former college president, he said, once you get the bug, you'll never want to leave. Not because of the money, but because of the opportunity to help and support the institution you love. And he was right. I was bitten and smitten, and uh, away we went. About four years later, essentially, I got a call from a recruiter who had two opportunities, and Saybrook was one of those. And it was interesting. It was this distance learning online institution, graduate only, which I had been interested in, you know, spreading my wings in that space. And sure enough, it it just turned out to be a, a really great fit with the board and the community. And that's how I got to Saybrook. And eight years later, and almost nine now, uh, we've been in this marriage for good and challenges all all together. It's been a really great ride. Well, that's that's a really interesting background. Just as an aside, Saybrook was one of the universities I looked at 
when I was going back for my master's and my PhD, oh. I decided on fielding, but you know, Saybrook was one of the ones I looked at. I appreciate that. I won't say anything about your choice drum, but you know, we, <laughs> <laughs> Well, Fielding is a wonderful school, but uh, we, and, you know, I know Katrina, President Rogers there. Well, um, you know, we, we come from that same cloth of progressive higher education and, and boy, it's, they're wonderful institutions for sure. They truly are. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit about your setup, which is a little bit different having the relationship with TCS education system, sure. but, you know, Right now, higher ed is facing some really, really challenging problems. We we all know that, you know, whether you're in the big seat or whether you're consulting to presidents and, and boards, whatnot. Yep. But you at Saybrook are bucking the trend. You the small especially the smaller colleges are struggling. But again, over the last eight years, you've doubled your enrollment. You've done some really, really neat things. Appreciate that. I appreciate yeah. that. We've been able to do that for a lot of different reasons. I, I think first and foremost, you mentioned uh, the TCS education system connection. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. When I first applied for the position and interviewed, that was a standout because at an institution where coming from, we have built all of our systems and, and worked on those in-house. The one advantage, of course, with TCS is you have this amazing back office solution with dedicated higher ed professionals to your own benefit. And it really made all the difference in helping pave the way. Uh, now, granted, the institution is responsible for its success or failure, but ultimately, I think TCS was a key ingredient there. And I think, you know, it, as we look at where Saybrook has been, I, you mentioned you know, we've grown about double over the last eight years. We started at around 450 students. We're now, you know, right around 1,015, projected to be at about 1,100 by the end of next fiscal year, so a year from now. And, you know, that really was predicated on a lot of different factors, right? I think you and I have had conversations before where there are no simple solutions. Some of it you got to throw at the wall and see what sticks, but a lot of times you have to go... <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what it is. You don't talk about that outside the boardroom or the executive suite. Ever. That's right. really what's happening. <laughs> right, right. Oh, we we have this targeted plan that we're going to do. And inside you're thinking to yourself, oh, I hope to God this is going to work. <laughs> <laughs> and every one of us knows a lot of times they don't work. You have to plan to fail sometimes, you know, and say. Exactly. You know, the, but when you find the right mix of things that do work, it can be really powerful. I would say for us, um, in terms of our success, how we grew, it's predicated on a couple, few different things. One is on our mission. You know, we are a mission-driven institution, right? I, there's no two ways about it. Our focus has always been over our 52 years, uh, humanistic principles, which is really about helping actualize the potential of human beings and living their best life, living into their life, not telling them how to do something, but working in partnership. And so that's a great way to build a student-faculty relationship. It's, it's not seen as this top-down connection. The other piece is a focus on social justice. And Saybrook has really moved into this realm. So it's an undercurrent in a lot of the things we do. And that humanistic ethos really says the life and dignity of every human being is important. And in so doing, that social justice component really ties that into a really beautiful bow. And I think we, you know, we, we advocate, uh, you know, socially and uh, really push for our students to think about how we can do things better as a society. And I think that's a, appealing to many of our students. So we lean into that mission. I mean, that's, that's number one. Yeah. And I think, you know, the other pieces around this is that, you know, we, we had to really invest in marketing. Now I I'm known drum and I don't know about you, but I didn't like to spend money. I was always nervous about spending money because <laughs> I was always afraid. What if I spend this money and it's a, it's kind of like throwing something at the wall and seeing what sticks. But in reality, you know, I, I had a trustee who said to me, let's think about if we made this investment, what is the informed risk we're taking 
and it's going to be a substantial investment. But when you think about marketing, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to do? And how well will you tell your story? And so that Mm -hmm. was the other key component, I think, for us in terms of our movement into a growth strategy. So those were the high level pieces around our success. And I think, you know, we've had, we've stumbled and we've, we've tried new programs that didn't work out. Uh, We've had to close old programs that did not work or were no longer working. Um, But I think that's also part of the process. If you're not, you know, with all due respect to our wonderful faculty, students and alumni in those programs, you sometimes have to figure out where to prune in terms of those programs in order to support the whole health of the institution. Yeah. Well, there's also the piece, and you started off talking about being a mission driven. You know who you are as an institution. Yes. That's, That's critical. Social justice is a piece and it underlies, but you know who you are. And then you've got to figure out where the market is. And that's something that you guys did quite a bit doing the market research and figuring out not only what you have, but what the market needs. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, when it comes to market research, it's both recognizing that the market research is never going to be, an. I think sometimes we get caught in the loop of it's the end and of itself, right? And, and what we have to really be thinking about is <laughs> it's really just, one piece. Sometimes market research will tell you not to do something. And in the reality of the situation, you have to take a risk and say, you know what, we're going to pay attention to that. And it may inform down the road, but we may take a risk in this space. And we've done that with a couple of our programs already, such as integrative nutrition, which is a great example. Happy to talk about that later. But I think that's another piece of it. And then also recognizing the brand of your institution. I know this is stuff that people talk about quite a bit, but your brand as an institution is so vital. And one of our uh, marketing VPs, you know, really stressed, you have to market Saybrook first. Who are you as an institution? And a lot of places get caught up in programmatic marketing as the sole focus. There's nothing wrong with that. But we felt and found that through our market research, students were coming to us because of our brand of who we were, that humanistic institution. And then they'd find their program that they were interested in looking for. They wanted an institution with values that aligned with them. I always you know, share this story with people when I'm, uh, you know, whether I'm podcasts or uh, talking with uh, our community. I have never, ever in my career been at an institution where, you know, I ask the question to new students, I'll give them a call and text them and congratulate them on their admission into the university. I'll say, why did you choose Saybrook? And they will say, it's your mission. And I will say, what is our mission? And they will tick it off just like that. And they said, it spoke to me, the heart, the soul, and you can see it in how people react and relate to you. So brand is not just a business marketing concept. It's how you live it, how you express it, how you are being in that uh, brand authentically. So I think that's a huge part. And most higher ed institutions don't realize they are a business. That's right. That's critical. I mean, I I tell my clients and my guests have heard this on the podcast. What is branding? What is positioning? It's answering the question, what's that one thing that's unique different and better about us in the eyes of our customer versus the competition in the marketplace that has them hiring our graduates, wanting to attend our institution or donating money to us. Oh, that's so true. That is so true. And you spoke to that. Students know who you are. That's your mission. And you, you know, as, as I don't want to say trite, but as how many folks speak, Oh, we're a, quote, mission-driven organization. No, they're not. They really don't know who they are. And it's not your business faculty talking about, oh, well, this is who we are and this is our positioning. It's finding out from your customers, finding out from your graduates, the people who hire your graduates, what is Saybrook about? Who are we? 
and you've marketed that brilliantly. Well, thank you. We appreciate that very much. And I, 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 I think you've hit something that's very important for your listeners to grab onto. You get that information from your students, from your graduates. I can talk about it. I can, I can opine about what I think it is all day long. Where I've learned it from is, you know, and our, our faculty are wonderful, but we all bring a certain set of, of thoughts, baggage, and otherwise to our roles, whatever institution we're in. But our customers... <laughs> really? I, I, I never would have guessed that. <laughs> Right. Baggage? We ain't got no stinking baggage. No baggage. None at all. No. But but drum acknowledging it is the first step towards healing, right? I think, you know. Right. Well, yeah, but we're not gonna go there, not, not on this podcast anyway. <laughs> but your point is well made, and, and that's where I learned the most about Saybrook was from our students and our alumni. And every every time I step into the you know, the opportunity zone of talking with our students, whether it is that welcome message or whether it's at a residential learning experience, I'm updating that file card in my head about, okay, how is Saybrook presenting itself now to the community? And it's changed. The pandemic has changed even how we are connected with our students today than it was even three years ago. Exactly. So, you know, not only have the external factors changed which is why you need to update your market research every you know couple three five years but stop and think about the students the students have changed now you do primarily graduate work Mm -hmm. you don't have the same kind of demographics but you're seeing more and more of gen z coming back for graduate degrees that's right gen z and other generations they think differently. So you have to continually update who you are while staying true to that same mission. That's right. That's right. And also looking at our mission and asking, is it still relevant uh, to, Bingo. to who we are today? And I think some institutions are hesitant to ask that question because, it, you know, legacy, history, et cetera. We changed our mission about four years ago. Oh. Uh, we updated it. Yeah, we we did an overhaul from top to bottom. It was a community discussion, and that's a it's a an important point I think for institutions to think about. It doesn't mean you forget who you are, but it, you have to ask that question because it informs how you present to the community and your relevancy in today's world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And talking to the community about it is so critical because people are really invested in that mission. You know, I think about fielding the way it was when I went through versus now, it's a very different place. Mm. And they've had to change because of market conditions and many other things. That's right. That's right. And if you don't, well, we know what's happening, as as you mentioned in the introduction, right? Yeah. Jack Jack Welsh, I think, was, was brilliant. He says, if the rate of change outside exceeds the rate of change inside an organization, Entropy occurs, the end is coming. That's right. <laughs> he said it right. Yeah, that's absolutely true. <laughs> the entropy part was mine. Yeah, but, you know, I like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, being a systems thinker, I figured you would. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Appreciate yeah. that. So the market research is obviously a key piece in looking at who needs to be doing it. But then you've got to figure out inside how the organization is structured, how it works and aligns with that market research and build your programs. So you've got to have the programs that reflect what the market research says. That's right. That's right. And and those programs have to be authentically delivered. Well, we And I'll, I'll tell you in terms of, you know, I won't name specific programs, uh, but I will say, you know, what we found. Oh, is, come on. Oh, come no, on. I, I got to. <laughs> <laughs> protect the names of the innocent, right? You no, know, some really talented faculty that we hired along with uh, the students that we've recruited into these programs. What we found is we took a, a stab, if you will, at, the, at, at some new programming, growing horizontally, right? And seeing where that fit. And what, what I've learned is that those, while they had, they were mission adjacent, they didn't fit our core necessarily. They were close 
and they had some mm-hmm. connection, but the relatability uh, just wasn't there. Um, the way we were marketing was not as strong. And in some cases, if they were mission aligned, they weren't relevant in the marketplace anymore. And I think, you know, that's the piece around working with both new and existing programs and the market research that you really have to play with and figure out what's resonating, what isn't. But also, if it is mission adjacent, is it really truly serving the needs of the institution, not just the institution, but the students that are coming into the institution in a meaningful way? Mm -hmm. And I think I would call it also, you know, we had a good colleague of ours who's no no longer at Saybrook, but talked about uh, authentic messaging and engagement of your programs. And I think that's such a key way of putting it. I really liked how she positioned that. If if your programs aren't authentically positioned, if they're not authentically engaging with the mission, they're they're mission adjacent or not part of the institution at all. So, Mm -hmm. you know, and Take a look at a say an R one institution that has a medical, you know, an MD program. Yep. They've got the clinical practice, all those things. Adding a nursing program onto that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Adding an acupuncture degree, whereas it may be interesting, does it really make sense for that institution? Correct. 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 So that's you know that's that's kind of an example of that. So once you figure out your programming, then you've got to invest the, the dollars for the marketing. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I, I think this is the scariest step, right, for a lot of folks. So, you know, I have a colleague of mine where he had mentioned to me, he had just started this position. He said, I've only got a $50,000 marketing budget. What do I do? And I'm like, I think you're going to have to take a, a mulligan from your board and get get a an increase in that that ex- expenditure. And, you know, a lot of times we think that the students will just find us and they don't just find you. You have to get your name out there. You have to cast your net wide. The students are out there and they are, are hungry for connection, for engagement, and for alignment of values, depending on what they're looking for. I mean, there are customers, right, at the end of the day. And, we put in several million dollars about three to four years ago into our marketing expenditure. It's a lot of money, um, no two ways about it. Mm-hmm. But part of that expenditure was predicated on the idea that we have a story worth telling, we have an institution worth enrolling in, and that students will have great ROI when they come here and graduate from the institution. The scary part is always, you know, you have to look at the value, right? So you have to look at the, what we call cost per lead, right? And, and, and how much you're putting in there. That's going to go up for a while, but the downstream effects, which is what we're experiencing now, are very positive, right? So we're seeing higher numbers of enrollment, greater numbers of students from all over the country. So we were largely California-centric, for example. So we're getting that geographic diversity, the racial and ethnic diversity that had long eluded Saybrook. Gender diversity is improving, increasing as we go along with age. So that marketing matters for the experience as well that you're trying to cultivate for your students. So it's an investment worth making, but it is something you have to be very very much willing to take that risk. And I think to your point, that market research, that focus on how your mission resonates and what your brand is saying is also really key. So it should not be ventured into lightly. It should be thought through carefully, but also jump in the deep end of the pool and get it moving. Uh, is Exactly. Yeah. So the audience has a sense. When you said you invested a couple, three million into your marketing program, what percentage of budget was that? So at the time, um, you know, our general... 10, uh, 10, 15? Yeah, I'd say probably, uh, you know, about 10 to 15% of our overall revenue for the yeah. institution. Yeah. Yeah. And for most institutions, they don't put that kind of percentage in. Now, that's like a one or a two year investment. You can somewhat back off of that, sure. but you've you've got to be able to prime that pump and get the word out there in very smart, calculated ways. And that is the the important 
add-on, smart and calculated ways. You know, um, a lot of institutions, not to be overly critical, but I think a lot of times it's not done smartly and with with a lot of forethought. It's mm-hmm. just putting it out there. So you really have to think about how you're going to do that. And I would say also the complement to all of this is the grassroots work that we do day in and day out. So a good example of that is, so our major national brand campaign complements our increasing programmatic campaign. So we have a process there. And then we have a grassroots or targeted marketing campaign. So part of that entails the podcast that I do, Saybrook Insights, which we do very much as Yes, it's a, about Saybrook University and it's very authentic and our faculty and staff and students and alumni are telling their stories and it's targeted at the prospective student. You know, what is Saybrook all about? And here you're, you're listening to stories about the university, which then kind of bubble up to that overall brand experience that people are seeing out in the world, whether it's on social media or on the web or on the the billboards or the panel symposia that our faculty are a part of. And so it, it's it's all interconnected and interwoven. And I'd love to say it was part of some grand strategy I developed six years ago, but it's really... <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. I know. You know what? <laughs> Sitting in that dark room with the, you know, the, the, you know, trying to figure it out. But it, using using an etch a sketch was it maybe? It might have been a light bright board, I think, or something. A light. Oh, there we go. Okay, that was that by works. pegs. Yes, yes, yes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely dating myself on that. One. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's two of it. And and fun fact, my dad made etch a sketches. That was one of his jobs. You know, when I, yeah, when I was. Thinking. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there you go. Those were cool. Oh, very cool. Yeah, they still make yeah. um, I think the important piece to note is you should always be updating your strategy. So one of the things we were noticing is that there wasn't, Saybrook is a very relational institution. And one of the things we weren't necessarily getting a hold of three to four years ago was that relational piece, you know, in terms of the brand marketing. And so that, you know, bred the idea of, of let's, have a podcast, but do it in a way that is really true to us. And that is what has evolved. And then it also comes to our alumni stories and the blogosphere that we have and and getting the student's voice out there front and center, highlighting, showcasing uh, what's happening. No one cares about what I do in public. They don't. I mean, and and I think presidents (laughs) who think students and the public truly care about them as what they're doing are kind of off base. And the best the best role model president I've seen do that is my former president uh, at University of Cincinnati, Santa Ono, who is now at University of Michigan. It's always about the students. It's about what they're doing, how they're, and that has really informed how I work as a college president because they're why we're there. And that's why we're inspired day in and day out. Yeah. So. Yeah. And one of, one of the things that you've done that I think is absolutely brilliant along those lines is you've gotten your faculty involved in the enrollment process. I mean, when I think back to my time at the Naval Academy, I always go back to those one or two professors that I had significant interactions with. Yes. You know, I remember a hair doctor, Professor Kalam who, you know, I was a physics major. He was a PhD from Germany who taught at Harvard for years. His his favorite characters were Darth Vader and the King of Ed, you know. (laughs) Uh, On on German military day, he he would march into the classroom with his German military hat with the spike on the top. Oh boy. He was a character, but he was brilliant. Only one time, only one time did I ever see him refer to his notes giving a lecture. And I had him for three courses. I mean, he was brilliant. Yeah. But it's the faculty. It's the faculty who student remember. And you getting them engaged, getting them building the relationships with students, that's brilliant. Well, I appreciate that. I think it's, you know, for, for us and for you know, my colleagues at other institutions, it's a work in progress, but I'm a firm believer 
in the way in which I was recruited into graduate school, which was by a faculty forum. We had a group of faculty that went around the country to recruit the students into their program. I'd, I'd never seen anything like that before. And each faculty member in the program talked about why the program was important, why it had cachet, what, what we would learn, how we would develop as learners, as uh, scholars. You know, I think that that really sent a message to me, the importance, because, you know, we could have read a piece of paper that talked about this, that, or the other, bringing it to life and hearing a faculty member articulate how it's important, how this can be meaningful and life-changing says it all, right? I mean, I think that really makes a big difference. And our faculty are coming along. You know, I think it, it I think it, I would be remiss if I said, everyone loved this concept of faculty <laughs> helping with truth. Um, everybody, everybody about faculty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Because, you know, I think as faculty members, we were all steeped in the idea that we're into the life of the mind. I mean, we're not here to sell widgets or or what have you. But in reality, if you're passionate, and I, I think this goes to even advancement and asking for money. And I, there's a connection here, Drum, I promise. When I first went out on my very first uh, fundraising call back in Ohio, I, did, I said, I don't feel right doing this. This feels, I don't know, somehow dirty, weird. <laughs> yeah. And the advancement professional, she said, okay, I need you to stop. <laughs> Think about it for a minute. Do you love, Smart. do you love your college? I said, I love where we're at. I love what we're doing. Do you love your mission? Absolutely. And you know, what was so powerful is she just said, so stop thinking about it. Like you're selling cars you are selling the institution as a place of beauty, as a place where students can come to learn. And it was like, boom, that, that you know, set the light off for me. And I think our faculty, those who are coming along with this ride, and, and we're building that capacity, and, and you see them all over the country, they're doing recruitment. What I've said to them is you're already doing it. I think what we want to do is expand it and, and, and create those opportunities even more so. And I think we have to as administrators, so I will say this, as you build a crew or a core of faculty recruiters, if you will, you have to be willing to show by example, to support them financially, support them through training and development, show them that you care about their programs, not just from a an enrollment perspective, but that you believe in what it is that they're doing and why it is that it's important and mission aligned. And I, I think presidents can do a lot in that space. And, and I've, I've gotten better in that area as well. You know, I think to be more um, emotionally supportive of our faculty in that space. And I think there's always work for us to do in, in bringing humility and a sense of esprit de corps uh, when it comes to that. Well said. Okay. Very well said. Thank you. So, as always, we are at the end of the time. Oh no! <laughs> uh, oh, oh yeah. I, I, I knew when we spoke the other day, it was this was just going to fly by. So, Nathan, three takeaways for your fellow presidents and boards. Okay, let's see. Have a realistic vision in your orientation to strategy marketing, but connected to that. Also focus on the incremental as a win. So focus on incremental as a win and incremental wins, right? So a vision is important, but be realistic. Be incremental in both the wins and uh, also be results focused in that incremental work that you're doing. You know, just really quickly, it's hard, I think, for presidents, especially from the academic side of the house coming into that, to really home in on the results piece. If you're not results focused and very simple, clear results that the whole team can get behind is essential. And when you start seeing those incremental wins that are focused on results, people get excited. I can't tell you when we, I said three years, two years ago, we will be at a thousand students in five years. We will be at 20 plus million in revenues. We will be at 10 and a half million in net assets. 
we've blown those results out of the water. And everyone will tell you on our executive team and our cabinet, thousand students by 25, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That results focus does make a difference. And then thirdly, I'd say for all of our friends out there, presidents and provosts and trustees of smaller institutions, as you mentioned, Drum, don't wait until it's too late. Seek help soon. Don't dig your heels in. Find people are willing to help, and it's not it's not focused around, uh, and it shouldn't be focused around just the institution. It should be focused primarily on the students. What are we trying to do to support them in their ultimate education? And we can find solutions together, what, whoever that is. But don't wait to ask for help. And of course, that's a commercial for my firm, and I thank you for that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> So, Nathan, this has been wonderful. So what's next for you? What's next for Saybrook? So, you know, we're concluding the rest of our strategic plan. Um, you know, my continued focus is on our long-term sustainability. We have had some great successes, but we have to stay focused on our core programs, our fundamentals, right? Expanding our programmatic and institutional reach and ultimately ensuring Saybrook is that university that continues to work 50 to 100 years from now. It's a, I think it's a bold statement in the hard, hard life of higher ed right now. And ultimately, Drum, I think right now for me, coming from a family of, of dedicated social work folks and, and public servants, mental health right now is a primary concern nationally, along with uh, the integrative health of our country. Saybrook has a huge role to play in that, and I wanna make sure that we're at the vanguard of uh, leading that and supporting other institutions and organizations that want to help heal our country uh, across this great nation of ours. We've, we've got a lot to be proud of and we've got a lot of work to do. I couldn't state it any better. I agree 100%. Well, Nathan, thank you so much for being on the show. I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. I look forward to the next time. Likewise, looking forward to it. Thank you, Drummond. Thanks for listening today, and a special thanks to Nathan Long for his sharing with us how he's doubled enrollment at Saybrook during his tenure. Thanks, Nathan. I look forward to the next time we have you on the show. Our next guest is Danny White from Accredible. Danny's is a unique story, a partnership between him and a colleague at his undergraduate university in the UK and that have built a company which is changing how higher education institutions deal with the business of transcripts. This is a bit out of the ordinary for the podcast, but what Danny and his team are doing has the potential to change how transcripts can be used by students, higher ed institutions, and employers while costing colleges and universities less money and saving them time. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic, along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show, and we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, Post-production by David L. White.